There we were, Marie Kingston, who had hitchhiked all the way from London, England. Amazing. I think in a couple of instances she got on a bus, so she wasn't just putting her thumb out. And um, Enoch Tabiso, the former employee of the Rhodes Livingston Museum, who I think worked as a groundskeeper, and myself heading to west along this road. And when we came to the location, oh, actually, I should back up. Um, when I came through the, ca the capital, Maun, which is the district capital, and I should say a word, at the time, Botswana was composed of, uh, the country was built around seven or eight chiefdoms, traditional paramount chiefs of the Tswana, and there were seven or eight of them, depending how you count them. And the northernmost one was the Tawana, whose uh, capital was in Maun. These uh, entities had been fixed by the colonial government because at the time, Britain had the indirect rule policy. And so I was told, uh, when you go to the, when you go to the capital, to Maun, the district capital, you really should visit the chief and sort of announce your presence there. And the chief is supposed to not give you his blessing and then allow you to proceed. And uh, it wasn't clear whether this was just a formality or this was quite an important thing. So interestingly enough, the old chief had died some years previously, Maremi, um, the second, I think, and his wife was the regent. And she was a woman in her 40s, and her son, who was the heir apparent, was then a teenager. So he was not uh, yet on the throne, and so I had to go to her. And it turned out to be a very articulate, thoughtful Tswana woman who... Uh, you know, gave me useful advice, and she said, when you get to the town of Nokaneng, I want you to look up our headman, our local headman, and uh, you should meet with him, and it's up to him to decide if he thinks you're okay, and if he says yes, you're good, but if he says no, then I'm sorry, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't do it. Um, she, but um, then she said, but he's a nice guy, and you'll not, I don't think you'll have too much problem with him. And um, the, so when we got to Nokaneng, the we looked up the head man, and he was a gentleman, a white-haired gentleman in the 60s, spoke no English, but he had an interpreter. And um, I told him what I was interested in. I wanted to learn the language. I wanted to learn how they made a living as hunters and gatherers. And um, he was uh, agreeable. And um, I can't remember if he said at this time, um, since you're going up there, I'll take a ride with you. Um, it's possible. But it's funny that that particular detail has I've lost. And, but he gave me his blessing. And he even said, uh, you know, I, my son Hakakoshi Isaka, his name was Isak, and the Tswana surnames are the first names of their fathers. That's the way the custom, the naming custom goes. So his name was Hakakoshi Isaka, and his father was Isak Utuhili. So he said, you should look up my son who wants to learn English and who might be helpful to you because he's married to a Zhenghua woman and you want to study the Zhenghuasi. Uh, the Zhenghuasi, of course, he didn't use the word kung. 
and the naming controversy is something that uh, I had to deal with years later. So he said, look up my son, Hakikoshi. And um, so we drive up there, and this time there was no British uh, civil servant to say, no, you can't go. And um, I, think I, I think that old Isak, the head man, was actually in the, in the vehicle with us. So that was, that was interesting. And so we arrived at a place called Goshi. And the first village, uh, there was a line of villages uh, that led to the border, the uh, border with Southwest Africa. The very first village was called Goshi. And so um, I get out, and I've written about this in a couple of different places, uh, but the general uh, drift of what happened there was I, I was told, give, tobac give out tobacco. People really like tobacco. So I gave out uh, tobacco. And then I said, I'm looking for people, because the people of Goshi were Junkwasi, speaking Junkwasi, but you could see they kept cattle, and they had agricultural fields. And I thought, OK, but I'm wondering, are there people who are still living as hunter-gatherers? And so the people of Goshi told, uh, told me through an interpreter that um, if you go west, uh, to almost to the border, but don't go too, as far as the border, there's a place called Dobi. And the people there are very traditional. And they really have not uh, bought into this cattle economy. And they really like to maintain their hunting and gathering way of life, and some of them are, my, are cousins of ours. So that's how I was led to Goshi. I led to, from Goshi to Dobi, and then um, along the way, um, I'm, and I'm now remembering, I'm pretty sure Isak was with us. We stopped at his village and dropped him off, and then he introduced me to his son, Hakakoshi, who was a man in his 20s, a little bit older than me, uh, who became, um, was the start of a 20 plus year collaboration with Hakakoshi. So it was uh, Marie, Enoch Tabiso, and Hakakoshi who went to Go Dobi for the first time. And I've described it in writ written in some detail. So I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly past it. But um, at the time, uh, I met a family who were very uh, traditionally dressed. The men wore leather breech clouts, and the women were dressed entirely in leather with a cross, which was made from a, a hide of an antelope, and then processed and tanned by a pro tanning process that was unique to them and uh, made into soft, supple leather, uh, uh, suede. I would call it suede. And that's how they were dressed. So I was pretty excited. And then I explained my purpose. And then um, uh, after a discussion of some time, question and answers, where do you want us? camp, how long are you coming, what are your purposes here, uh, what are, um, and then I was taken aside by one very old man, a uh, very vigorous old man whose name was, I learned, was Kuma Gwe, Kuma Gwe. And um, when I said, uh, asked, well, what is, Kuma is your first name, your given name, and they have no surnames. The Junquasi have no surnames. But what is the Gwe? And um, the, uh, I was explained to me that they have nicknames. And this particular uh, nickname, so because a lot of men are named Kuma, it's actually the most popular men's name. And uh, so in order to distinguish one Kuma from another, we give nicknames. And this nickname refers to a, plant, a fruit called the sour plum. And it's not really in the plum family, but it is sour. And I thought, 
how interesting because this old guy was a pretty sour guy and not, you know, uh, not a sweetheart by any means. So after we had discussed with his family and you're going to camp here and you can draw water here and, and so on, he took me aside and with the interpreter, he said, I'm really glad that you're here. And they had no advance notice that I was going to come. I just showed up. I'm really glad that you're, you're here. Why? Because years before, across the border in, on the other side, a family named Mascheró, which was clearly the Marshall family, a family named Mascheró came and the people over there got blankets and pots and food and tobacco and guns. No, no sorry, not, uh, not guns. They didn't get guns, but they got metal for spears and they got uh, clothing. And we over here on our side got nothing. And now, now that you're here, and he has said, now finally we have a white man of our own. And that was his, that was his take on the situation. You know, eat your heart out. We have a, our own white man now. So he said, and when you give all those things, don't give it to those other people to the east. Give everything to us, to us, and um, not to the other people. And so I thought, uh, at the time, I was kind of dumbfounded because uh, in the writings of the marshals, and Elizabeth Marshall had written a beautiful travel book called The Harmless People about six years before, uh, and sort of an autobiographical account of her year with the, with the family and the Kalahari. They were called The Harmless People then. And they're described as for whom generosity and sharing is the prime directive. And here was a selfish old man, the sour plum, and so, I, uh, you know, I had to grapple with it, and uh, how do I process this? And um, I said, well, it's clear that things are more complicated than I anticipated, and that there is, uh, if, there, if sharing is the prime directive, it doesn't come without uh, some costs or some, some pushback. And so uh, at that moment, I was... Uh, began to uh, say, okay, well, I'm here, and now, you know, my future uh, as an anthropologist uh, is, uh, lies before me. And in the first few weeks, uh, the, by this time it was October, and the rainy season starts in October. And so, um, so I was um, looking around, where am I going to pitch my tent? So I picked a spot that was, um, I thought, was nice and clear and not too many rocks. And so I said, we'll, we'll make our camp here. And then um, a f about a week later, the first rains came. And they ca it rained overnight. And when we woke up, we were ankle deep in water. And we had picked a spot where there was just a layer. There was, I thought, oh, it's a sandy desert, so the water will just sink away. But we picked a spot where there was an underlayer of rock, and so we were soaked. And at the same time, when we opened the drawers of the tent, we looked out, and the Junquasi were laughing hysterically. Just they just thought this was great, great humor, and so um, so then. Um, we obviously had to move our camp. And um, I hope I'm getting the historical facts right, but now that I'm reconstructing the initial party, there was actually another person in our party. So if you have an image of Richard Lee, the lone anthropologist in the desert, you quickly have to get past that because it ain't, uh, ain't so. The other person, was a graduate student from, I think, Northwestern University in Chicago by the name of Susan Buckland. And she was, uh, I think, an archaeology graduate student. And just as Adam Cooper had piggybacked on our first survey, 
uh, through the net anthropological network, uh, someone at the University of Chicago or at Northwestern said, uh, Sue Buckland is out there. Do you think you could you know, accommodate her for a couple of months and uh, give her some uh, opportunity to go to the Kalahari? So I believe that our group, uh, initial group, consisted of Marie Kingston, Sue Buckland, myself, and this uh, fellow, uh, Enoch DeBiso. And so we began to work. There's one other uh, element, uh, just to, in the interests of historical accuracy. Uh, there was a well-known uh, Tswana man who was fluent in the Juntwa language. His name was Coronel Ledimo. Ledimo. He had been Lor Lorna Marshall's primary interpreter and translator. And when I passed through Cambridge, Mass., a few months earlier, she said, you really must look up Ledimo and hire him as your, uh, as your interpreter, because obviously you, ha you, you don't speak the language, you're going to need an interpreter. So I had picked up Ledimo, and so our group consisted of uh, not just me, uh, and Sue Buckland, and Marie Kingston, and this Enoch guy, but um, Ladimo, who uh, met me in Nokanang. And indeed, he was a very charming man who was quite fluent in Zhengtuasi. And um, so for the first uh, few weeks, I worked with Ladimo, and um, I found certain disquieting things about his interpretation. And um, he was a Tswana aristocrat, and he definitely saw these people as his subordinates. And so, uh, and I didn't understand a word, but they would, I would ask him to translate a question, and then I could tell that they're giving an answer, and he's saying, no, that's not the right answer. You know, and he would re-ask it again. So I thought to myself, this is kind of uh, running, um, everything uh, I'm going to be getting is running through the censorship of this particular uh, very capable interpreter, but he has his own ideas about it. So I decided, and then I thought, what if I hire this guy, I'm going to get exactly what, Lorna Mar what he gave to Lorna Marshall. <laughs> And so I made a decision. I said, thank you, but I don't think I'm going to uh, be um, needing your services. And then he, what, he said, that's fine. I have business. You know, he had extensive cattle uh, location, you know, s cattle posts elsewhere. Uh, and so he said, that's fine. Just get me back to the main road, uh, and I'll go on my way. So there wasn't... I don't recall that there was a lot of uh, animosity on his part. Uh, and then I said, instead of hiring this guy, I'm going to go maximally into learning Zhentuasi. And in fact, it took me a year, but I learned Zhentuasi, and then it was, at that point I could dispense with an interpreter. And that's, that was 50 years ago. So um, I still benefit from... Uh, checking my um, language against, uh, bi now there are bilingual, lots of bilingual Zhengtuasi, but back then there weren't um, bilingual Zhengtuasi. So I would ask, I, ha I would ask uh, the, um, I would ask a Swana speaker, there were Swana English speakers, and there were Swana Junquasi speakers, but there was no English Junquasi uh, that I could find. So I would ask my my uh, question in English, then it would be translated into Sichuana, and then it would be translated into Junquasi, and it would come back through the broken telephone. So I even learned. Uh, enough Swana to ask basic questions in Sichuana, 
at least cutting out one middleman. But then I was much more comfortable after a year just speaking directly in Jeuntoisi. Now, uh, while we're on the subject of translation, Hakakoshi Isaka, the chief's, the headman's son, uh, was very in interested in working with me, and I thought, well, he doesn't speak any English, but he does speak fluent Sichuana and very fluent Zhengtuasi. And so if I learn Sichuana, uh, or if I have a Sichuana English interpreter, I could work with him. And so we worked out a plan. And then um, fast forward to field trip number two, number three, number four, number five into the 70s and 80s. Um, by that time, I was very comfortable in my uh, working with Jun Kwasi, but um, he was always helpful if there was a, often a word. I said, I'm missing one word. What is this word? And he would explain it to me in some combination of simpler Junquasi or in Sichuana. So I, I'd say, okay, I've got it. And I had a Sichuana English dictionary. You know, you give me a Sichuana word. I would look it up and I'd say, okay, I've got it. Because at the time, I don't recall there being a Junhua English dictionary, although there, since then there have been some. And um, so that's how my first uh, months of fieldwork proceeded. And I was, um, my dissertation submitted in 1965 was titled Subsistence Ecology of Kung Bushmen. So my focus was definitely on plants, animals, weather, geology. Uh, that was my focus and uh, not so much on kinship, uh, religion, uh, social organization. Although it turned out I did, you couldn't really uh, get into the culture without doing the other social cultural uh, areas as well. So, but I, my start in my field work was like this. I was um, learned a sentence. And my first sentence was, what is this? And I would point. I'm sure that hundreds of anthropologists have done the same. Uh, what is this? Achere, achere. And that, and it was mostly for plants. And I had five by eight car, uh, you know, three by five cards in my pocket. Achere. And they would give me a name. And then I would say something like, a small plant with reddish leaves, you know, 16, 15 inches high, and that would be my card. And then I'd go to another thing, a jetty, and then they would give me another name. And so uh, by the end of uh, the first few months, I had a, a list of about 100 plants. And um, I had my second sentence was, a kai kwa, a kai kwa. That was my second sentence, which translates as, do you, do you have use for this? Is this useful? And there were two, uh, there were three answers. <laughs> no, it's just a plant. Or yes, we eat it. Or uh, yes, we, we, make, we make tools with it. Or we, it's medicine. Or it's cosmetics or something like that. So I was getting pretty um, comfortable with this arrangement and um, people would, uh, I found that people were very pleased to be teaching their culture to somebody. And um, it was just uh, generosity of spirit on their part. I would give them uh, a a handful of tobacco, of leaf tobacco, which uh, was appreciated. And um, that seemed to be the currency of the, uh, of the time. And I would um, then, as my language ability got a bit uh, better, I started to work on kinship. And so um, 
this is this is sort of one of their jokes about me. Um, I, I would say, Akureo Ajwe, what is your name? And then my next sentence was, Abakureo Ajwe, what is your father's name? Ataikureo Ajwe, what is your mother's name? And then I would give all the kinship um, terms, like, and they have older brother is a kinship term, older sister is a kinship term. Younger brother or sister is a single kinship term. They don't differentiate by gender. And um, then, I, so I began to collect genealogies. And now I have about 300 genealogies in my field notes. Some of them go on for you know, five or six pages. And um, they began, to, one of my first nicknames was Abant Laba, Abant Laba, which is, translates as your father's father. And that was my, uh, you know, my, one of my lines. Oh, here comes Abant Laba, here comes your father's father. Uh, but they were also very happy to be, uh, you know, to be giving this, uh, giving this information. And uh, they didn't have, uh, there were a number of people peoples elsewhere in the world that had taboos about uh, speaking the name of the dead. Like, I think the Yanomamo uh, in South America had a taboo about speaking the name of the dead. But this was not the case among the Junquasi. So when they spoke about their father's father, their father's mother, uh, they didn't have any problem with uh, uttering the names. And so uh, for the first six months, I was really zeroing in on plants and then animals and then um, kinship terminology. And uh, that became a major focus in my second field trip, uh, which I can come to. And um, then in Christmas of 1963, there was a... Um, we had made arrangements to spend Christmas in Mozambique with uh, people that we had met, uh, what, uh, British civil servants that we had become friendly with. And they said, well, we're going to be in Beira or Beira, Mozambique for Christmas. Why don't you come? It was only a thousand miles away. But, uh, and crossing in from uh, Botswana or Bechuanaland into Rhodesia, from Rhodesia into Mozambique. And so uh, that was, uh, I said, okay, sure, we'll meet you in, uh, and then uh, you can, I think back on myself as a mid-20s anthropologist having this enormous energy, like, who? why not? We'll drive a thousand miles and, and then a thousand miles back. But when, um, and so uh, the last uh, gasp of the 1963 fieldwork was, it torrentially rained for three days and three nights uh, before we were leaving. And when we left, Marie, Sue, uh, Enoch Tabiso at the time, when we left, the roads were underwater. And so it was a kind of epic journey to get uh, out to the main road where there was still plenty of uh, uh, places to get stuck in. And so... That was the end of our, and we made it to for midnight mass in Baira, Mozambique, in 1963.